continue on. What? Oh, scripture reading. Thanks, McKenna, for reminding me. Man, McKenna and Amaya, come on up. You want me to remove my stuff? No, we're not. You're going to read it because I'm not. Microphone. Thank you. Good morning. Sorry, that was loud. You almost forgot about us, but it's mm. okay. You've already graduated and moved on, yeah. so. <laughs> we're done. So we're going to be reading from Romans 12, and we're reading the whole chapter, so please try to bear with us. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable to be perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to, but to think with sober judgment and each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and, all, and the members do not all have the same function. So, though many, so we, though many, are one in Christ, and individually members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them. If prophecy and proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Over what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in the spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that we get to gather together this morning and open your word together. We pray that you would um, open our hearts and our ears to listen and accept what um, is in your word today. In your name, amen. Amen. Thank you, girls. All right, Romans 12. If you're not there, turn there. Oh, you guys erased my whole sermon. Just kidding. So I've had, I've had the, the privilege of sitting through a decent amount of graduation ceremonies and, and commencement speeches, and all of them are actually pretty similar. Uh, the speakers are picked mostly by how successful they are. Of course, the success is mostly defined by worldly standards. The rich and famous, if at all possible, if you can throw a football, dribble a basketball, have started a successful business, you are a doctor, a lawyer, a politician, uh, those are the people who are asked to give the commencement speeches. The speeches that are meant to spur on our graduates to live successful lives. Right? Nobody's asking the, the homeless guy to give the commencement speech. Nobody is asking the faithful, average Joe who loves his wife and kids and has sacrificially worked a regular, regular job to provide for his family. Nobody is asking the stay-at-home mom who has laid aside her career to pour into her children to give the commencement speech. Those categories of people don't define success according to the standards of the world. 
The speeches that these speakers tend to give kind of are predictable. Be proud of your accomplishments. Work hard. And you most certainly will accomplish your dreams. You will face obstacles, but with a positive attitude, you can pick yourself up by your bootstraps and overcome the trial. Most of them at some point, quote Dr. Seuss, Think left and think right. Think low and think high. Oh, the things you can think if only you try. If I'm honest, most commencement speeches leave me wanting to quote Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 1, 2, and 3 says this. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What what does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? The world is crying out, get rich. Get all you can, climb the corporate ladder, be successful, run over anyone who gets in your way. It's your life. Live it how you want. Meanwhile, God is saying, True happiness is found in surrendering your life to me. Live for my glory, not your own. Be holy as I am holy. Now, I'm not saying that there is anything wrong with being successful or a hard worker or overcoming adversity, but what I am saying is I agree with the preacher from Ecclesiastes. Apart from God, it's all vanity. Apart from God, it's all vanity. So what then? What would, what would a good commencement speech sound like? Well, I think it would sound a lot like what McKenna and Amaya already read. It would sound a lot like Romans 12. So we're going to take the next few moments to walk through Romans 12 together. And this, just, this isn't just application for our graduates today. This is application for us. Romans 12 is for all of us who know the Lord. If you don't know the Lord yet, and I, I ask today that you evaluate. Surrender your life to Christ today. We will, to some extent, feel like we are flying through this. There is a lot in Romans 12. A lot. We could, we could land here for a month and still not cover everything here. So we are going to go fast. I will get you out, out of here on time for your crockpots. They won't burn. So we're going to camp out here for a little bit. Let me pray before we start. Lord, we, we're so grateful for your word. We are grateful, Lord, for the opportunity to know you through your word, to to try and understand how you ask us to live our lives for your glory. So we pray, Lord, that as we dig into Romans 12, you would give us wisdom, you would give us discernment. And above all, all, all else, Lord, you would give us the desire to be doers of your word and not just hearers. That Romans 12 would penetrate our hearts we would obey the commands that are so clearly laid out here. We pray all this in your son's holy name. Amen. Romans 12, 1 and 2 is where we'll start. Be a living sacrifice. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says this, I appeal, I appeal to you therefore, therefore is pointing back to chapters 1 through 11, where Paul expounds on being saved by grace through faith. You cannot save yourself. By grace through faith. I appeal to you, therefore, in light of chapters 1 through 11, in light of of being saved by faith through grace, in light of that, brothers, believers in Christ, those who already know Christ or are following Christ, By the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, 
what is good and acceptable and perfect. How are we to live as believers in light of the mercies of God? Paul says here very clearly, we are to live as a living sacrifice. Paul is speaking in temple sacrificial terms. What he most likely had in mind was probably the whole burnt offering, a perfect animal presented at the temple without blemish or defect, selected for the burnt offering. This showed that you would be giving God your best, your very best for the sacrifice, not your leftovers. Not your leftovers. But notice Paul says, a living sacrifice, which has some irony to it, as the Greek word for sacrifice actually means to kill or to slaughter. So translated literally would be a living killing. Present your lives as a living killing or a living slaughter. When we translate it that way, it brings into view verses like Galatians 2.20, which says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Colossians 3.3, 3, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. In Luke 9.23-24, and he said to all, if anyone would come after me, this is Jesus speaking, let him deny himself, take up his cross, take up his, his instrument of death and torture, let him take up his cross Daily, every single day, and follow me. Seek after me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Died to self and made alive in Christ. We become a living sacrifice, which is our spiritual act of worship. Our life in Christ is worship. It's not, it's not just music on a stage or music that you listen to. Our entire lives are to be an act of worship, a sacrificial act of worship to our Lord and Savior. True worship of God is saying, here is my life, Lord. Here's my life, Lord. It is yours. I want to live for your glory and not my own glory. And then we get a what? what to be and what not to be. Paul then tells them the how in Romans 12 too. Do not be. Do not be conformed to this world, but be. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Do not be conformed. Do not be like the world. Don't strive after the world. Don't look like the world. The pleasures of the world are fleeting and temporary. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. But the pleasures of God, the pleasures of God are everlasting. Don't conform. And the world will scream. They will scream for you to conform. Believer, the world will mock you. It will, it will pressure you to cave. It will persecute you. If you refuse to conform, it, if you stand firm in your faith, faith, the world will hate you. They will hate you. So the question is, do you have resilient faith? Or will you conform? Do you have resilient faith or will you conform? John 15, 18 says this, again, these are the words of Christ. If the world hates you, know that it hated me first. It hated me before it hated you. Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be, be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. 
for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Do not conform to the depravity of the world. Stand firm and have a resilient faith. Do not be conformed, but be transformed. Well, how, how, do, we, how do we be transformed? That's the question, right? Well, Paul answers that. By the renewal of our mind. By the renewal of our mind. Why does our mind need to be renewed? Why do we need to have a renewed mind? 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. We covered the list, right? Covers every single one of us. We are all sinners. And such were some of you, Paul says. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. And such were some of you. Our minds need renewed because we were once sinners. Our depraved minds thought like sinners. We need to renew our minds day by day. Yes, by the blood of Christ, we are washed, we are made new. We have died to sin, but we all know the reality. We all know the struggle. We still battle sin day by day. We battle the flesh. We battle our sinful, prideful, arrogant flesh. I, Jason Reed, battle sinful, prideful, arrogant flesh every day. Sanctification is a process. Sanctification is a process. We have to battle to renew our minds. Colossians 3, 1 through 5 says this, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Every day, battle to renew your mind and to think more and more like Christ. To be in the word, to be in prayer, to sit under the teaching of the word of God, to have the accountability of the body of Christ. And to renew our minds, we have to be cautious of what we let in, what we watch, what we listen to, what we hear. We should ask the question, is this thing, is this going to help me renew my mind? Or is it going to push me further into a worldly mind? Is this going to draw me near to Christ? Or is it going to pull me further away? Next is verse 3, Romans 12, 3. We'll talk about having a humble confidence. Verse 3 says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Arrogance permeates our culture, doesn't it? Selfishness goes hand in hand with worldly success. We are taught from an early age to be proud. Be proud. Be boastful. We are taught to think of ourselves with high esteem. High esteem. But Paul says no. He says, do not have an overinflated view of self. But what he does say here is also very interesting. He says, don't think too highly of yourself, but think with sober judgment. Or in other words, don't think too low of yourself either. In humility, we recognize. We recognize that we owe God everything. 
He is creator. He is sustainer. He is sanctifier. He is savior. By his mercy, by his blood, by his grace. It's all his. All of it is his. My talents are God-given. My spiritual gifts are God-given. Assets and abilities, it's all God-given. It's all his. Every part of it is his. So then who am I to think more highly or too highly of myself? Instead, anything remotely decent about me is a reflection of the greatness of God. It is all a reflection of the greatness of God. Arrogance has no place in my life. Overinflated sense of entitlement has no place. My gifts and talents are not better than the next person's because they are not mine to start with. They are God's. On the other hand, sober judgment tells me I am fearfully and wonderfully made. It tells me that I've been blessed with talents and gifts for his glory. Being made in his image gives me value. It gives life value. I know that God loves me. I know that he has chosen me. He has adopted me as one of his own. I am an heir with Christ. I know that nothing can separate me from my Father in heaven. I am secure in his hand. Sober judgment is not false humility that degrades self-worth and value. Sober judgment is humble confidence in who God has made you to be and what he has called you to do in his strength, in his strength. So therefore, we can walk with humble confidence. Next, belong to the body, Romans 12, 4 through 8. Y'all thought for a minute we were just going to go verse by verse and we were going to be here all afternoon, right? Four through eight, for as in one body we have many members and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. One body, many members. The function of the body is dependent on each part functioning as it should. If one part one part is not functioning, then the entire body cannot function at 100% capacity. My dear wife is an illustration of this, right? She has discovered what one ligament in the knee can do. Our bodies need each part to function well. Every tissue, every joint, every ligament, every single part. And our bodies are not made up all of an eye. It's not all an ear. Every part has a different function and a purpose to make the body work. But this body imagery that Paul is talking about, it is played out in the context of the local church. Of the local church, the local body. We are called to be one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Individually members of one another. Individuals make up the body. But if the individual is not present or engaged or performing their God-given purpose in the body, it's really difficult to live that out, isn't it? It's really hard to live that out. And not only are we not living it out individually when we are absent or not engaged with the body, but also how much is our body hindered from doing what we are called to do? One ligament, one ACL has sidelined my wife since February. Since February, not able to function at capacity. How much better would our body function if we were all engaged? If we were all operating in the giftedness that God has given us? In Christ, we all have a role and we all have gifts and we are all called to use them. Called to be part of the body. So be the body. Be the body. 
And let me clarify this too. This body that we speak of, it is not about you. It's not about you. It's not about what you can get out of it. It is, a, it is not about being inward focused. It's not about, about being inward focused at all. Being part of the body is about being outward focused for the glory of God. For the glory of God. And that's made even more evident in the next section. Be an authentic Christ follower. In this section, Paul continues outlining what it looks like to be an authentic follower of Christ, or as he puts it, what it looks like to be a living sacrifice, what it looks like to be God-focused and others-oriented. This section is full of imperatives, full of commands, as in not optional. Verse 9 kicks it off with three imperatives. Romans 12.9 says, Let love be genuine, Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Let love be genuine. Agape love. Self-sacrificing love. Love each other. Love God. And it doesn't matter what you get in return. Right? We're talking about that Jesus-type love. Sacrificial love. And Paul is saying, let it be real and let it be authentic. The Greek word there for genuine translates literally as without hypocrisy. Without hypocrisy. Don't pretend to love like Jesus, but actually love like Jesus. And abhor what is evil. Detest. Despise what is evil. Detest the sin that is in us. To test the sin and evil that is in the world. And he says to hold fast to what is good. So the word for hold fast is literally to glue or join together inseparably. But we have to answer the question, what is good? What is good? God and his word. The things of God. The command is to be glued or joined together inseparably with God. Abhor the evil, despise the evil, despise the sin, and, and be stuck. Be stuck inseparably to God. Romans 12.10, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. In Christ, we are called to love one another, the body, with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Right? That, seems, that seems pretty obvious, doesn't it? Like we read that and we go, yeah, that's obvious. It makes sense. Except sin. Except flesh. On paper or reading it, it is all well and good, and we look at it and we say, yes and amen. Yes and amen. But what about the believer, the brother in Christ that rubs you the wrong way? What about that believer that has a different opinion than you? What about that person that's too talkative? Or that person that didn't talk to you at all? Or you fill in the blank for whatever excuse or reason you can come up with to not follow the word of God. The reality is people are messy. People are messy. We are all sinners saved by grace. But somehow, somehow the church, the body of Christ, can somehow be known more by their gossip by their slander, by their backstabbing, than by showing brotherly affection for each other. That's not a new problem. Not a new problem at all. We see countless scriptures where Paul is addressing this in other bodies and other churches. Not a new problem. It was a constant warning throughout the New Testament. But that's not the intent. Our body is called to be marked by brotherly affection and sacrificial love, not to be marked by sin. 
We are called to walk in the spirit, not walk in the flesh. Romans 12, 11 says, Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Don't be lazy. Don't be lazy or hold back zeal when it comes to the Lord. Be on fire. Have passion. Be passionate about the things of God. It's easy, easy to become complacent. It's very easy to go through the motions of Christianity, to walk through the motions of Christianity. But Paul here says, don't be slothful. Don't be slothful. Don't lack zeal. Don't lack passion. Serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. For the sake of time, I'm not going to walk through all of these other markers, but I'm going to read through them. So 12 through 21 says this. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, for by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So there's the call of Romans 12. There's our call to be a living sacrifice. Our call to not conform to the standards and debauchery of the world, but to stand apart. Stand apart, to be set apart, or in other words, to be holy. To be holy. Holy literally means to be set apart. When we're called to be holy, we're called to be set apart for the purposes of God. In my opinion, what we have in Romans 12 is the stuff of a great commencement speech. And it doesn't even have a single Dr. Seuss quote. The words were not penned by an athlete held in high esteem. They weren't written by a man who was successful in the eyes of the world. In fact, the words written in Romans 12 don't even belong to the hand of the man that wrote them. They belong to God. But the man that God used to write them was, by worldly standards, an outcast. Paul was beaten. He was arrested. He was put in prison. He was mocked, abused, and often found himself homeless. Most Jews of the day viewed Paul as having thrown it all away. The dude threw his life away. A promising young Pharisee with the world in front of him. A Jew of Jews. But this is what, this is what Paul said of his Jewish worldly success. He said this in Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 8. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrew. As to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, I was blameless. I was blameless. And he says, but whatever gain I had, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth 
of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. All worldly things is what he's talking about. All things that the Jewish people held in high esteem. I have lost all things, sacrificed all things, and I count them as trash, as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ. In order that I may gain Christ. So that's the story of the man who penned the words of Romans 12. So let me read to you, graduates, a commencement speech from a homeless, outcast prisoner that by the world's standards of his day, he threw his life away. My challenge to you today is to live out these words. I appeal to you, therefore, Christ following 2024 graduates. I added that part. That's not Paul. By the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's the challenge. Live that way. This time, I'm going to have Pastor Jeff come forward. I'm going to, if you graduates, I know you ran to your seats, but I want to have a time of prayer for you. If you would would come back forward one more time. Pastor Jeff is going to pray for you. Not sure, yellow mic. Yeah, come on up. Thank you for these young ladies, all that you've allowed them to accomplish in their lives. God, we we just come before you humbly today. God, you have given these young ladies life. We know that you have a great plan and purpose 
a design for their lives to bring you glory. And so, Father, would you fill their hearts with the Spirit of God, not only this day, but God, every day hereafter. And Father, you would give them a spirit of wisdom, a spirit of discernment. And God, you would set a safeguard on their hearts. And Lord, the evil one would have no access to them but that, Holy Father, they would be completely yours. And, Lord, they would live lives built on the strong foundation of Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Uh, Father, would you guide their steps? We know that they make their plans. We each do. But, Father, you guide our steps. You're faithful to do that. And so will you help their hearts to be yielded to your will? God, as you direct them, may their hearts just be in such a state that they would say, yes, Lord, whatever you want. Even if it means it's not what I had designed for me. Oh, Father, we pray today that you would uh, continue to bless and strengthen each one of them. Bless their parents. Uh, Father, thank you for the faithfulness of their moms and dads. Uh, God, their love for you and, and how they've sought to parent them and instruct them and lead them in paths of righteousness. Uh, Father, we ask, God, that you would uh, bless uh, and encourage them as well today. And so thank you, Mighty Father, for all that you're going to do through these young ladies. Uh, Encourage their hearts even this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Here is your 2024 West Rome High School graduates.